So we've had a great morning so far. We're talking about pigeon peas. We've spoken about carnival. And now we're talking about something that definitely caught many people's attention, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the world. Talking about Trinidad and Tobago and the Dragon Deal. Joining us this morning is Mr. Adam Raful. Adam, good morning and good welcome morning. to the show. For those of you that, well, welcome to the show, Adam. For those of you who don't know, Adam is the Vice President of Policy at the Heliconia Foundation. It's a pleasure to have you this morning. Same here. So, this is a conversation that we definitely need to have because some people saw it announced, many people just sort of went, oh, it's not a big deal. Other people said, this is absolutely amazing. But one of the main things that we want to know is what can we look forward to the benefits for our economy. Okay. So let's get into that immediately with the Dragon Deal. So, so Natasha, I think most people really, you know, if you're not, any, not in the energy sector, mm -hmm. you don't really know too much about it. Okay. Right? The energy sector in China and Tobago accounts for about 80% of our exports. 80% mm -hmm. of our foreign exchange, because most things here, you know, we just don't produce it, right? Mm -hmm. The government is trying to diversify the economy. So the Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association and the Trade Ministry of Trade are trying to double non-energy exports by 2025. But the grand scheme of thing is we need energy. We need, we need to export energy resources to get foreign exchange, right. to import the things we need, cars, food, clothes, electronics, etc., etc. right? Mm -hmm. So what, what is Trinidad and Tobago's energy industry? Well, back in the 1970s, when Point Leases was conceptualized, basically our policymakers at the time decided, instead of just exporting our energy resources, let's use it to make value-added products. So that became the steel industry. Eventually, instead of flare and natural gas, we decided to make methanol, ammonia, and then we started to do liquefied natural gas. Mm -hmm. In Trinidad and Tobago, despite our small size of 1.4 million people, we are one of the largest producers of liquefied natural gas, methanol, and ammonia in the world. That's a very astonishing fact. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't actually understand how important that is. Right? So it's very important um, what we are able to do. And we've been in the energy industry for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. Now, the major issue we have is if you're in the energy industry for over 100 years, well, you have something called mature fields. Right. right? So the fact is, oil and natural gas is not something that you could just, you just keep drilling and you keep getting, right? Eventually, fields start to run, off, run out of it, and then you have to tap into new fields. Right. So natural gas production varies month by month. It's available on the Central Bank um, website. It, because as old fields start to decline, new fields come on stream. Mm -hmm. So it, it gradually you know, increases and decreases every single month. Right? But the fact of the matter is we need something like 4.2 billion cubic feet of natural gas mm -hmm. to run all the, the methanol and ammonia plants and urea plants and Atlantic LNG. Right? Currently, we're producing about 2.85 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas. Mm. So we're significantly below what yeah. we need, basically, right? Correct. And that has caused thousands of people in the IG industry to lose their jobs through plant shutdowns. It has also caused a lot of these plants to run below capacity, mm -hmm. right? So that means it's not as profitable as it should be, right? That means if Trinidad and Tobago doesn't get as much taxes as we would want from it, Correct. or as much as foreign exchange from it, mm -hmm. right? So how what what does the dragon deal mean right right so the prime minister would have talked last week tuesday on this right and it was basically we we've been trying for the last couple of years to import natural gas from venezuela mm. venezuela is one of the largest um you know has one of the largest amounts of natural gas and oil in the world right yes and it's basically they're so close to trinidad and tobago mm -hmm. so we were pursuing this so when, you know, when the PNM administration came in in 2015, it started, like 2016 and so on, because it's something that the successive governments have been trying to do. Correct. Right? What happened was in the Trump administration is the Trump administration, the U.S. government, put sanctions on Venezuela. Correct. Based on the reality that they thought that elections in Venezuela wasn't free or fair. Mm -hmm. Right? So they put sanctions on the Maduro, Maduro administration. 
They did. Now, um, just to, as we come onto the screen yeah. here, we're seeing there is a diagram, right? Now, can you share with us, because for those of us, of course, who may not be as or are not as versed as you, this is the dragon field that we're speaking of here? Yes. Right? Okay, so viewers, you're seeing that on the screen right now. I see it has turned out either while and Venezuela. Quite interesting there. And this is basically where we eventually, or where we, where we have received the license and where we are going to be able and work. Exactly. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's the dragon field as north of Trinidad, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's something called hibiscus, which is run by Shell. Okay. Right? So it's very close. So basically, what... The, what we got approval from is mm -hmm. we got something called a sanctions waiver. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. government still has sanctions on Venezuela. Okay. So no country really wanted to touch the, the um, energy industry in Venezuela because if you're sanctioned, well, then you can't do business in the outside world, right, with right. the U.S. government. So the point is we got the sanctions waiver mm -hmm. last week. Now we need to try to work with, it's about 350 million cubic feet of natural gas. Right. So you're producing um, 2.85 billion cubic feet. You add on 350 million, say so about about um, about 3.2 billion cubic feet mm -hmm. when that comes on stream. Now it doesn't solve the entire problem, right? Because you still need to reach the 4.2 billion cubic feet. But it's a framework that if we could get that natural gas, mm -hmm. then that means we could actually get more natural gas from Venezuela in the future, right? right? There's another field called the Loran Manatee field. Okay. Right? It's about 73% in Venezuela and the balance in Trinidad, right? So we got approval, we decoupled the field, and now we, we're producing, we're going to produce, Shell is going to produce in the Manatee field. When you say decouple the field, what do you mean? As in well, it's a, it's a cross-border field, okay. right? So we, had, we decided, we were trying to pursue you know, utilization of both the, of the entire field right. and bring it to turn that. Mm -hmm. But the problem was, because of sanctions, of it couldn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, Shell is working on, on the process to start production. Now it will come on in a couple of years, right? That's the humanity section. So the question is now, if we get through a dragon, well, that eventually could lead to Loran, Wonderful. right? And it's also a framework too, because if commercial natural gas comes available in Guyana, mm -hmm. eventually we could possibly look at that, right? Mm. Because, but it, again, it just, it just, be, it's just based on the numbers, yes, right? So we act when we get this natural gas, that will help point leases because it's running below um, capacity. Mm -hmm. It may bring back on a methanol plant or ammonia plant, or based on basically what has come out in the news is the U.S. would kind of like us to produce more liquefied natural gas yeah. and direct some of that to the Caribbean, of such course. as Jamaica and Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. Now, the cost of electricity in, Jama in the rest of the Caribbean is significantly more than Trinidad and Tobago. You know? mm -hmm. Even with the proposed increases, they're, they're sometimes like maybe three or four times more than what we pay for electricity. Correct. So if they could get cheap natural gas and create natural gas power plants, well, that significantly helps them, right? And yeah. it costs a living. So what does this really mean for us in Trinidad and Tobago? Well... It means good things, I have to course. say. Well, but I mean, good things come to those who wait as well. Yeah. It is not something that's going to happen overnight. Exactly. You mm -hmm. know, because first they have to get the approval. They have to agree with Venezuela. Right. Second of all, it's not only about... Um, you know, we can't give the Venezuelan government cash, right, based on sanctions. Yes. So it has to be, what they're looking at is maybe humanitarian items. So mm -hmm. Venezuela still is facing a lot of economic issues. So it may be food and medicine or various different manufactured goods in Trinidad and Tobago, which we've done in the past. Yes. So it's, it's something that we have to look at. But at the end of the day, what it means in a couple of years' time, that's going to be more natural gas for Point Lisas and Atlantic Energy. More natural gas means more jobs. Yep. It means more exports. It means more foreign exchange. And more foreign exchange helps the non-energy sector. Correct. Because although we're trying to expand manufacturing in Trinidad and Tobago, although we're trying to expand agriculture, the grand scheme of thing is majority of things we, we use, we cannot produce competitively in Trinidad and Tobago. So 
what that means is at least we get the foreign exchange to import the, the items that we need right. to, to live a good life. And we maximize on our resources as well exactly. that are naturally available to us. I'm so thankful that you came yeah. on the show this morning, especially to discuss, you know, what this can lead to in the future, the creation of jobs. We've yeah. just come out of a COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, we're still essentially yeah. in the throes of COVID-19 and many have suffered. And, you know, a lot of people, when they saw that come on the screen, they said, well, well you know, that's the energy sector. That had nothing to do with me, but it's such an amazing trickle-down effect it's that so will related. take place. Because it's 80% it's of our foreign exchange earnings is from the energy sector. So when someone complains they can't get $100 at the, the mm. bank, right, to travel <laughs> or whatnot, yeah. right, the, the better the energy sector is, you know, you're getting better things. And if obviously, of course, more US dollars to, to our non-energy sector, yes. that helps manufacturers who need the raw materials mm -hmm. to import, uh, imported raw materials, and that helps the retail and distribution sector, you know, to import food and pharmaceuticals and clothing and cars, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it helps trout. Yeah. Now, now the government only, besides doing this deal with Venezuela, they also been doing a lot of deep water bid rounds. They've been doing shallow and, and land bid rounds. So, you know, the last couple of years has been tough for the energy services sector. It's less drilling and so on, but it seems like things are turning around. And what that means is we should see more activity in terms of more production in the coming years because they've just been doing recent bid rounds. Yeah. So that means that's very good news for the energy sector again and again. Although we're trying to diversify the economy, it's still the, the lifeblood of the economy. It is, definitely. And, you know, something else that I know the Prime Minister would have mentioned in the press conference, thanking the other CARICOM nations and leaders for their support in this. And what you just mentioned there with example, the price of electricity in other Caribbean countries, in some places, honestly, it is insanely high in comparison. Of course. And to... This now also shows the relationships that we have among ourselves in the CARICOM region and also that we're going to be able to help other islands mm -hmm. bring down their cost of living as well. well which it's, is it's also key. a major win for our, our embassy and our, our prime minister and Minister Young, mm -hmm. right? Because we went to the, the U.S., we lobbied, right? In the U.S. too, they have their own issues and division yes. on this topic, right? There are certain people, you know, certain Republicans, for example, who are against the, the freeing up of, of sanction relief mm -hmm. from Venezuela, right? Even in President Biden's, um, you know, party, there, mm -hmm. are, there are Democrats who are against it too. Yes. So it's a major win um, oh. for us because we lobbied. We, we went to Washington, D.C., we lobbied, we, we got the help of our Caribbean neighbors, mm -hmm. and we also, I think, you know, credit has to go to Vice President Harris, yes. because she, her mandate was, over the last year, was to have um, meetings with the Caribbean leaders, and she listened, right? Mm -hmm. We're 1.4 million people, right? We're not a significant country in the grand scheme of things, right? But she listened to us. You know, our contacts in Washington, D.C., various congressmen, etc., lobbied and batted for us. And that's very important. And we also came to the U.S. and said, hey, what, right? There's a war going on in Russia and Ukraine. That has created a major issue in Europe in mm -hmm. terms of their cost of living, in terms because they were mostly dependent on Russia yes. for natural gas, right? And the last year, they've reduced that significantly through liquefied natural gas. Right? And I would have written an article about this about a year ago, mm -hmm. right? That turned out to be a small player could help Europe oh, in definitely. terms of reducing their dependency on Russia. And today, Europe is significantly less dependent on Russia. The reason being is because they're, they're importing liquefied natural gas from the U.S. Mm -hmm. and even from Trinidad and Tobago. Exactly. Right? And that's the important thing. Because Trinidad and Tobago is a safe and secure source of energy, of liquefied natural gas, of methanol, ammonia, which is for fertilizers, in the world, because we're not, we're not going to invade any country, <laughs> like Mr. Putin, right? We are, we are reliable and we're safe and secure. And that is what our policymakers told um, President Biden mm -hmm. and the White House, that we're safe, you can rely on us, and we will help energy security globally. Wonderful. That was the perfect way to close this interview. We ran out of time. And there's a lot to discuss about this. I love the fact that you mentioned as well the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
So much to talk about, but Trinidad and Tobago, Adam Raful, the Vice President of Policy for the Heliconia Foundation of Young Professionals, just sharing with us a little bit on the Dragon Gas Field. Unique Not Different is up next on the Now Morning Show. We'll be right back.